This is a really dumb idea. Skunk Boy muttered. He shifted his weight on the chameleon cloth pad he'd been lying on for the past 36 hours. He was pretty sure he was developing some sores on his elbows and knees. Worst of all, he was running out of bags to store his piss in, and pretty soon, despite all the modium and MRE peanut butter, he was going to have to take a and it was a choice between sneaking into the building and risking getting caught, or taking one of the alternatives that would make him even more miserable. All in all, it was pretty much like any other mission for a scout sniper, except that he was laying all alone on the roof of a Hong Kong skyscraper rather than in the middle of the woods or the desert. On the other hand, there was the noise. Even with the plugs in his ears, the dual roar of the building's ventilation equipment was beginning to rattle his jaws. He blinked back the exhaustion and closed his eyes for a few moments to clear the blurry double vision from them, then lowered his face back to his spotter scopes. Hong Kong at night was actually kinda pretty, he decided. It was just a shame that he wasn't going to have the chance to do any sightseeing, except for their small stretch of warehouse near the docks. A flicker of light and movement caught his attention. He swung the scope around very slowly, then nodded to himself and kicked his throat mic for the first time over six hours. Sparkplug 2 to all units. How do you read? Over. Sparkplug 1. Reading loud and clear. 3. Loud and clear. 4. Loud and clear. Over. Got it. Everyone reading loud and clear. 2 here. I've got a mission report. Opposition elements are approaching the docks on schedule. Canboy consists of four vehicles. Description follows. One convertible sports car. Red. Highly customized. Two SUVs. Both black. One van. Also black. Veritas reads. Two persons in sports car. Four persons each in the SUVs. Two persons in the van. No Veritas signature from the back of the van. All persons read as baseline humans. No paratreads. Break. Um... Four here? Spider said, interrupting Skunk Boy. You're certain there's no Verita signature from the back of the van? There should be at least one. Over. Two here. With one. Skunk Boy adjusted the settings of his Verita scope and did a second scan of the van. Yeah. No die, Spider. Nothing. Over. That's not right. The manifest included at least one living creature. Damn it. Skunk Boy heard Spider mother under her breath. He was sure that the team's stomatologist was pacing back and forth again, as she tended to do when agitated. Damn. Do you want to abort, Spider? Bullfrog replied. No, I'm good. Spider said. But keep a close eye on them for me. I don't know what's going on. Alright then. Mission is a go. If the shooting starts, I initiate. Acknowledged? Do here. We wait until you shoot or order it. Over. Three. Keaton said. You start the shooting, over. What do I do if we start shooting? Spider asked. Hit the deck and find some cover, Bullfrog said. And hope you don't get shot. That's not a very comforting prospect. Spider said sardonically. It'll have to do. Let's cut the shutter. Out. Skunk Boy adjusts his stance and stretches his toes out a little bit, just a little longer, and it would be all over. Lao Feng isn't going to like this, Seng muttered. Lao Feng can kiss my Zhang said. His superstitions haven't gotten us anywhere. Meanwhile, the civil swords are cutting into the market. Girls, guns, and drugs aren't going to cut it anymore. We need to get in on this on the ground floor. This isn't like running hookers or heroin, or even guns, Seng insists. This is more like getting involved with dealing nukes or chemical weapons. I don't like this. It wasn't a new argument. The two men had argued these points many times in the past few days. Every time, the disagreement ended the same way. You'd rather let Shi Wang Su and his dogs run all over us? You'd rather see that lefty filling up your little sisters? John growled. Because that was going to happen if the silver shores get a lock on the market. You know I don't want that, but... This is scary. Keep it to yourself then, Jiang muttered. 
I don't want you pissing yourself in front of the foreigners. You know I've got your back, bro. I know you do. Jack agreed. Alright. Game face, little bro. The red convertible pulled up to the warehouse and came to a halt, followed shortly by the two SUVs and the van carrying the goods. Jack's brow furrowed as he looked into the dimly lit, empty warehouse. I thought they'd bring more people. He admitted. Arrogant. Seng agreed. He got out of the convertible and jogged over to the first SUV, rapping on the window. It rolled down, tinted glass giving way to reveal a huge man with a sardonic grin and an ugly, poker scar running along the entire left side of his face. What's up, Yang? They only got three people. I don't want to spook them, so have the rest of the boys wait outside. Yang said, You're the smart man. What if something goes down? Much less likely to go down if the foreigners don't think this is a f setup. Everyone stays outside. Yang insisted. But keep an eye out and make sure everyone's armed. You got it, bro. Yang took a moment to adjust the color on his shirt in the reflection on the side of the SUV before rejoining Seng by the convertible. Ready? He asked. Yeah, let's go. There were three of them waiting inside the dimly lit warehouse. Two of them looked like brainless dogs. One of them, a tall, muscular-looking woman with bored eyes and short cropped hair. The other was a short, stout-looking man with a big beard, whose ill-fitting suit stained to contain his broad chest. Jung marked them as soldiers, probably bodyguards for the third, an Asian woman wearing a well-tailored suit, fairly young and attractive in a broad hippet sort of way. She was nervous, despite her best efforts to hide it. She kept pushing up her glasses and fiddling with her expensive-looking tablet computer. Maybe a new lieutenant for the actual boss. You're late, she said irritably as Zhang walked into the warehouse. And you brought too many people with you. Are you sure you didn't brought enough? Zhang said, grinning disarmingly. If I were carrying that much cash on me, I'd have brought more than two guards. I did. The young woman said curtly. She fiddled nervously with a lock of her hair. Tell the dog outside to please look down at his chest before he gets any more ideas about sending teams to flank us. Yang turned and looked out the door and pushed his lips before nodding to Seng. Face? Seng growled into his walkie-talkie. Quit trying to be clever and tell the boys to go back to the cars. But... Look at your chest, you f idiot! Saying snap. The foreigners have you in their sights! There was a brief bout of cursing over the radios, as the scar-faced goon finally saw the red dot floating on his chest, and a flurry of movement and shouting as a bunch of guys sheepishly emerged from the shadows and jogged back to the cars. I thought that snipers usually don't use laser sights, Jung mused, especially not visible light ones. Consider it making a point, the woman said, sighing in relief. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, shall we move on to business? Skunkboy carefully turned off the laser pointer and slid it back into his pants pocket. It was a silly trick, but one that worked pretty well for intimidation purposes. The taller one with the fancy silk shirt nodded to his friend, who growled a couple of words into his walkie-talkie. The big man pulled away from the two SUVs and began backing up towards the warehouse. Skunk Boy whispered over to comms. I don't have line of sight on the inside of the van. What's the... outside? Bullfrog muttered. Let the kitten and I worry about the van. Boss, there's eight of them... outside. Skunkboy gripped. Even I can take on eight of them. Then get the leader and keep the rest of their heads down if it comes to that. Wolfrog said. And we'll help out as soon as possible. Easy for you to say. Skunkboy muttered, but he tucked his head back down and continued to scan the exterior scene through his rifle scope. Just to be sure, though, he made sure he had a round in the chamber. The van doors opened and the young woman's brow furrowed. She reached into the back of the van and rattled the bars of a heavy gauge wire cage. 
It's dead, she said. It was alive when we left, Yang insisted. Well, it's dead now. The woman hissed. She rattled the bars of the cage again and threw her hands in the air. What am I supposed to do with a dead specimen? Stuff it and mount it? I don't know. Wait. The woman snapped. Are these cage bars still? Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem. These things are allergic to ferrous metals. The woman shouted angrily. No wonder it died on the way here. It was probably dead of shock before it got halfway here. And you brainless dogs didn't notice? Kai? Young growled. We heard the yelling and thrashing, the younger man admitted. But we thought it was just... You stupid idiot! Yang shouted. You didn't think to tell me? But... Kai halted and beat back the rest of his words before bowing his head respectfully to the other man. No excuse, sir. Get the... Back to the van and start unloading. I'll deal with you later. Yang shouted. He turned it back to the woman and gave her his best, most charming smile. Now, I deeply apologize for... I'm not paying full price for the shipment. The woman interrupted. Two million only. That's half what we agreed upon. Zeng objected. Just because one stupid animal is dead? That stupid animal was the most valuable thing in the shipment. Otherwise it's trinkets. Two million. Take it or leave it. We'll take it, Yang said curtly. He turned to his friend and said in a low voice, You want them to start dealing with the source instead? Two million isn't enough. We can't arm ourselves on two million. We need at least three. Seng pointed out. We'll make do with two million for now, and we'll set up a second shipment for the foreigners. That's not going to help if the silver source make their move before then. Then we'll have to pray they don't, Yang said. Maybe you should invest some of that two million on incense for the gods. He slapped his friends on the shoulder and turned back to the foreigners. Two million? Oh, thank God. Skunk boy sighed. You have no idea how close that ugly dude out here came to shooting. He actually had his gun out of its holster. Well, it's over now, Bullfro said. So get packed up and let's get the f out of this country. All right, I'll see you. With one. Skunkboy howled as something moved in the corner of his field of vision. He panned the scope down and to the left. He snapped. Boss, I up. Young was surprised when the big foreigner, the man, put his hand on his ear and shouted, Situation report! In English, very loudly. He was even more surprised when the foreigner grabbed the young woman by the shoulder and pulled her away from the band and pushed her to the ground, one hand dipping into his jacket as he did so. What the hell is this? Yang shouted. We're about to get hit! Bullfrog snapped. This is a f setup! Yang turned to yell for face Deng and the boys to get ready, but as he turned to face his soldiers, he realized that all eight of them had their guns out and pointed at him. Oh, so it's that kind of setup. He grabbed Seng by the collar and pulled him to the ground just as the shooting started. It was really too easy in the end. All but two of the boys were in on the plan, and those two were in the warehouse with Yang and Seng. It was too bad that his plan to sneak a few guys to block off the back exits had failed. But he would make do with two to one odds. Face Teng wasn't exactly the brightest bulb in the back, but he was smart enough to see where the tide was turning and the tide was most definitely turning away from Lao Feng and towards Shi Wang Shou. Not that he had anything against the old man, but there was no way the family was going to survive, not against the resources the silver source could muster. Lao Feng was old school. He believed in the gods and the spirits. That sort of antiquated mindset wasn't going to work anymore. It was a shame that a bunch of good boys were going to die, Good boys that she went show could use. At the very least, he'd get to see the f Yang get it. Skunk boy! Bullfrog shouted over the comms. Take this out! Can't! Skunk boy shouted back. I've got three vehicles full of triads coming up the road. Bullfrog shouted. 
he was seriously hating this entire mission. Bullets were snapping past his head and splittering the wooden crates behind him and punching holes in the side of the van. He could already see one of the triad guys laying on the floor in a pool of blood. A second was huddled behind the van's wheel, weeping and cursing as he tried to stop a wound in his leg that was burning blood. A second burst of gunfire skipped off the concrete and into his gut, and he slumped over, bread gurgling. The two remaining gangsters had managed to get behind cover along with his team, the boss guy with the fancy shirt and his friend with the angry eyes. They had pistols in their hands and were firing wildly over the tops of the crates before ducking back down as another burst of gunfire stitched through the air. The situation, Bullfrog realized, was looking pretty much unsurvivable. He was pinned down by a force with superior numbers and firepower. He had the advantage of cover for now, but it was only a matter of time before the enemy managed to flank him. Then he was going to die. It was time to do something stupid. Kitten! He shouted. The tall, weary woman glanced up from her position. Her expression had not changed one bit from its usual boredom, even when a close burst caused a bullet to whip by so close to her face that it actually ruffled her hair. Bullfrog slid his pistol across the concrete to his teammate. Go start some, he shouted. Pitten's eyes lit up, her mouth twisted into a fire's angry grin. Bullfrog saw her draw the biggest knife he'd ever seen from some hidden sheet under her suit jacket and hold it in her teeth. She closed her eyes for a moment, inhaled once, long and slow, exhaled sharply. Then she moved. Skunk Boy had a bit of a love-hate relationship with the United States Marine Corps. On the one hand, they'd taken half a decade of his life, forced him to endure food and idiotic colleagues, and basically given him nothing but hatred and contempt for the modern military. If he had to deal with one more slogan spewing jarhead in his life, it would be too much. When the recruiter had asked him to re-up after his first term of service, He'd laughed at the guy to his face. On the other hand, there were times when the Marine Corps' way of doing things could be useful. Like when you were a lone marksman on the roof of a Hong Kong building, trying to stop three big bands full of bloodthirsty triad gangsters. At times like those, there were few things that felt more comfortable, more familiar to him than his old parish island indoctrinations. This is my rifle, he murmured as he shifted over to his weapon and lined up his shot. There are many like it, but this one is mine. He was going to have to time his shot perfectly. It would be best if he could catch the convoy just as they were about to exit, where the street narrowed, between two warehouse buildings. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. The driver. That would be a tough shot. Maybe he should go for the engine instead? My rifle, without me, is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle through. Deep breath. Inhale. Exhale. Take up the slack. Line up the shot. Get into the rhythm of your own beating heart. I must shoot straighter than my enemy, who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. Crack. The first round was a good one, but Skunkboy was already working the bolt and lining up his second, even before the first round hit home. He had barely enough time to see the bullet punch through the hood of the vehicle, enough time to see the hood start to spew smoke. He fired his second shot, was gratified to see the driver's side window shattered, but the driver had slammed the brake so hard that the car behind it rear-ended the lead vehicle. He saw the driver stumble out of the door and start yelling and waving to his allies. I will. Crack. Skunk Boy saw the driver of the lead car stumble and slow up to the ground, rolling in agony as he clutched his abdomen. The guy riding shotgun was trying to lean over and get the car moving again, so Skunk Boy put another round through the hood for good measure. Then he got to work. Face Tank's first warning 
was when the two smoke grenades came rolling out from the dimly lit warehouse and began spewing red smoke all over the area, causing the world to become shrouded in a scarlet mist. In the light of the street lamps, it gave the entire place a hellish air. Watch it! He shouted to his teams. They may try to escape through the smoke. There was the sound of rapid moving feet. He saw the tall female foreigner sprinting across the open court. Her eyes were wide and wild, and she had a giant knife in her teeth and a gun in each hand. Face Ten wanted to laugh. Everyone knew that there was no way in hell to shoot straight with a gun in each hand. The foreigner had been seeing too many John Woo action movies. He dug behind the van as a wild fusillade of gunfire snapped towards him and the boys. The shots were mostly wild and failed to hit anyone, as expected. All he had to do is wait for the to run out of ammunition and then... He saw Love Boy Lou go down. Something spun in the air where it had bounced off his forehead. One of the two pistols the had carried. Featherhead guy tried to shoot her, got his submachine gun kicked out of his hand, and then she bit his face in with the butt of her empty pistol before slashing open his throat with the huge knife. She'd never intended to hit anyone. The pistols were just to keep him and his boys' heads down while she closed the distance. She slid the empty pistol back into the direction of the warehouse, where the big male foreigner stomped it with his foot and reloaded. He raised the pistol in a two-handed grip and began firing slowly and methodically, hugging the wall of the warehouse. Within a few moments, six of his guys were down, two more killed by the crazy with the knife, two of them shot by the big male. Thanks, Will broke. He turned and ran for it. As he fled, he could hear the scream of his two remaining guys. After a few minutes, he couldn't even hear that anymore. Skunkboy often thought that an enemy unit in panic mode looked a lot like an anthill after someone had poked it with a stick. There were a bunch of the triad guys milling around, pointing in every direction, shooting out the windows at random, and yelling at each other a lot. It was almost comical. A moment like this didn't seem to disturb the solemnity of the rifleman's creed. It was time for something a little more... upbeat. We shoot the sick, the young, the lame, we do our best to maim. He hummed. He knew he had the biggest grin on his face. He didn't care. Because the kills all count the same. Crack. Napalm states to gets. He ejected the magazine of his rifle and laid it neatly next to the two empty mags he'd already gone through. He carefully seated his third magazine worked the bolt, and raised the rifle back to his shoulder. Flying low across the trees, pilots doing what they please. Crack. One more triad down. That made four. Dropping frags on refugees. Napalm sticks to kids. All things considered, this was actually going pretty well for him. Situation report. Wolfrock snapped as the firing ceased. I've got the backup pinned down. Skunkboy reported. Looks like they're getting ready to book out. Eight down. Kitten said. One got away. The scar-faced one that started the shooting. I'll find him. Zeng hissed. Lao Feng isn't going to let him get away with this. Ten good soldiers dead in one night. I know. Yang said grimly. But for now... He turned back to the Asian woman who he had thought was their leader and bowed deeply and respectfully. My apologies, he said. I was unable to control my men and put us all in danger. If you had not been ready for them, we would have all lost our lives. I promise you, we will find the traitor and exact our punishment against him. When I find him, I'll feed him his own balls raw, after I cut off a finger for each of our brothers he killed. Seng agreed. I think I can help you with that. Spider said. She pushed her glasses up into place, and her dark eyes were fierce and angry. Face Ten wept as he staggered through the alleyway alone. It just wasn't fair. This wasn't how it was supposed to happen. American 
weren't supposed to murder 10 trained triad killers with a knife and a pistol. He, Face Tang, was supposed to be the terror of Lao Feng soldiers. The terror of Lao Feng soldiers wasn't supposed to run from a battle with his pants stained with urine and a giant gash across one arm. He was going to have to go to Shi Wang Shou. It was his only choice. The Yang would make sure everyone knew what he had done. And the families didn't treat traitors very well. He'd gambled and lost. It was time to get out of the game before he lost his entire stake. He was stepping out into the light of the rising sun when he felt the pain stab into his lower abdomen. He screamed as he crumpled over and clutched at his stomach, then began to howl in agony as a burst of blinding pain started at the base of his spine and raked slowly up his back. Then he clutched at his eyes and wept as what felt like pure fire stabbed into his optic nerves. As the soon rose over Hong Kong, the man they called Face Tang whittled and howled in agonizing pain, unable to do anything but huddle in the shadow of the abandoned warehouse and scream. Spider gave the burlap doll one more vicious stab in the groin for good measure, before pinning it to the side of the van with kitten's knife. She had stitched the doll together many weeks before, filling it with graveyard earth and a dash of silicone oxide. It only needed a link to her indebted victim to provide the contagion it needed to find the target. A link like the blood kitten had thrown when she had, spectacularly, slashed open the unfortunate Tang's arm with her cookery. Are we done here, Spider? Bullfrog asked. Yeah, we're done. She turned to the two triad leaders and slipped back into her childhood Mandarin. You'll find your traitorous dog of a former colleague at the east side of the docks. He'll be screaming in agony. Don't take the knife out until you find him. Who the hell are you people anyway? The fancy man in a nice shirt asked. Don't worry about it. Spider replied, smiling disarmingly. Better to think about what you guys are. Which is? The ones who rotted out the traitor working for Shi Wang Shu and brought him back to Lao Feng alike. She hopped into the back of the van alongside Kitten and Bullfrog, who had finished loading the goods into their vehicle while she had performed her working. She gave the two perplexed-looking Chinese gangsters a cheerful wave as the three of them dropped out of the warehouse. You do realize? He then pointed out that we need to retrieve Skunk Boy. He paid the Hong Kong Police Department and somehow make our way back home now, right? Yep, Bullfrog said. Just wanted to be sure. The tall woman leaned back her seat and closed her eyes. A few moments later, she starts snoring. Sometimes I envy that crazy... Bullfrog admitted. That wasn't exactly what I had in mind when I agreed to join this operation. This you all find said to the shimmering image of the old Chinese man sitting in the chair across from her. The objectives were met. The shipment was stopped. The mole was rooted out. And soon, Shi Wang Shou's illegal operation will be halted. Lao Feng, leader of the immortal Lily Brotherhood, said. He picked up a teacup that didn't exist in old Fang's office and took a small, measured sip before wiping the rim with a napkin and putting it back down on the tea table. We also shoot up a Hong Kong warehouse, killed over a dozen guys, and brought the attention of the Hong Kong PD upon the entire thing. Old Fine pointed out. I hope whatever you found out from the informant was worth it. It was. We confirmed the Chi Wan Show found and took over an abandoned factory manufacturing plant and reopened it. He has been pumping out threat entry-level artifacts daily. His quality is shoddy, but his prices are much cheaper than his competitors. Lao Fen laughed and shook his head. The irony was not lost on me. Will you need our help in taking them down? 
I could dispatch a couple of strike themes. The day the immortal Lily Brotherhood needs your help in a war against its rival gangs is the day we finally join your global occult coalition. Lao Feng said, smiling properly. No, I thank you for your help, but we shall handle this matter ourselves. Just as long as you hand over all factory assets to the coalition. Old Fine insisted. Of course, I have no desire to get involved in paranormal matters. The affairs of ghosts and gods are no place for a simple Hong Kong businessman. You are going to have to, eventually. It's not a good sign that two of your most trusted lieutenants try to pull off a paranormal arms deal right under your nose. Or fine point out. I knew of their plans long before. If I had not wished to root out the traitor in my organization, we would have had words long before. As it is, I feel I own Jiang an apology and an explanation. Perhaps it is time to tell him what the immortal Lily Brotherhood really is. He might not be happy. He signed on to join a triad gang, not an ancient Chinese order of monster hunters. He will adapt. Goodbye, man. Goodbye, Lao Feng. You know, seeing sight. One of these days I'm going to end up following you into an early grave. The two gangsters were sitting together on the balcony of one of the immortal Lily Brotherhood's safe houses, watching the sunset over Hong Kong. The city, Jiang Tov, had never looked more beautiful. No one says you need to follow, Jiang pointed out. You could just run. Dying would be easier, Seng said. He put his hand over that of his friends and lean in to kiss the other man on the cheek. As it is, you owe me for this, my brother. Dinner at the Lucky Dragon then? Once the heat dies down? That would be a good place to start. Seng laughed. And maybe now we can enjoy ourselves without that homophobe thing giving us. It would be hard for him to call me up with nothing. Zhang agreed. He kissed Seng back and the two men shared a brief moment of affection before walking back into the apartment and turning out the lights. Outside, the sun finally dipped below the horizon, shrouding the city in twilight.